Hello everyone. Today, the eminent personality we have with us needs no introduction as his pioneering work in the field of medicine has not only contributed a lot to the Indian healthcare but is recognized all over the world. Dr. Amrish Mittal, the renowned endocrinologist, was awarded the Padma Bhushan in the year 2015. Dr. Mittal was the first DM in endocrinology from the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in the year 1987. He was awarded the NIH Fogarty Fellowship. Dr. Mittal established India's first bone density measurement system and osteoporosis service in SGPGIMS Lucknow in 1997 and has received widespread recognition for his work related to vitamin D and bone health over the last two decades. Dr. Amrish is the first and only Indian to receive the Boy Frame Award of the American Society of Bone and Mineral Research in 2004. He received the Springer Citation Prize in 2013 for his paper on global vitamin D status. Most recently, he was awarded the IOF President's Medal at the World Congress of Osteoporosis 2016. He is currently a member of the Governing Council of the Indian Council of Medical Research, board member of the IOF, and editor in chief of the Indian Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism. Dr. Mittal has been the president of the Endocrine Society of India. Dr. Mittal currently serves as the chairman and head of endocrinology and diabetes division at Medanta. Dr. Mittal, we welcome you to the platform, Dr. Plexus, and would like to ask few questions on behalf sure. of our doctors. So, to begin with, uh, in India, osteoporosis has become the most common problem these days. Do you think, do we, or you can suggest the reason behind it? Firstly, I'd like to thank you for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be on Dr. Plexus. Uh, you choose to start with osteoporosis yes. so well yes osteoporosis is certainly increasing in india uh, osteoporosis is a disease more and more of of developed societies of societies where people are not physically active their diet and lifestyle changes and not only that because of overall better medical care they tend to live longer So osteoporosis was not a big problem in India because people weren't living long enough, you know. So now that our longevity has in, is increasing, we find more and more elderly population, elderly patients, especially in in the larger cities and metros. And therefore, these are the people who are more likely to get affected by osteoporosis. that is so one is increase in aging population as a whole the second of course as i briefly mentioned is the fact that while we are aging we have more population in the in the sort of elderly group or the aging group we have changed our lifestyle so our level of physical activity has gone down our dependence on modern processed foods with less antioxidants has gone up and a combination of all these factors has really led to the increase in osteoporosis and osteoporosis related fractures in india so we would really like to know why is osteoporosis called the silent bone disease yeah i mean lot of people come to us with aches and pains and maybe coming to you with aches and pains and say i've got osteoporosis and my aches and pains are because of my low bone density but actually that's a myth because osteoporosis is a silent disease till a fracture occurs so you have a condition like where there is a low bone density the bone becomes fragile but it hasn't actually broken or cracked and therefore you get no symptoms at that point but once the bone snaps that's when you get acute osteoporotic fracture or pain you have to think of this a little bit like you think of cholesterol which all of you are well used to you know cholesterol <coughs> high cholesterol is a risk factor or predisposes you to heart attacks but high cholesterol per se does not produce a symptom till a heart attack happens right so that's how osteoporosis a silent disease 
till a fracture occurs. then how different is the management of osteoporosis in males and females means what point should be kept in mind while treating different genders yeah i mean i think osteoporosis has long been regarded as a disease of women and definitely if you if you look at the overall prevalence then it is more in women than in men uh, so however men are also significantly affected by osteoporosis so let's take some numbers here So, if at the age of fifty, one in three women, you know, if you study women at the age of fifty, one in three of them will get a fracture, osteoporotic fracture, somewhere during their lifetime. And if you study men at the age of fifty, one in five men will get a fracture somewhere during their lifetime. So, so. Uh, both men and women get osteoporosis women get it more than men and that is obvious because women have this process of menopause during which their hormones decline substantially and therefore there is a accelerated bone loss the treatment of osteoporosis nowadays between men and women is not as different as it used to be in the early days women were given hrt estrogen or hormones as treatment of osteoporosis which are not so popularly used anymore so estrogens are not popularly used even in women so when we talk of treating osteoporosis in men and women the other agents which is agents like bisphosphonates which are the mainstay of osteoporosis therapy or teriparatide their actions are not different so the main difference in men and women is that in women in the past estrogens and hormone replacement replacement therapy was used still is but occasionally whereas it was obviously not used in men in men who are deficient in hormones like deficient in testosterone testosterone can be used but the mainstay of osteoporosis therapy which are bisphosphonates and teriparatide and now denosumab they work across both sexes there is no real discrimination there So as you mentioned about the menopause condition <coughs> so how is the different management is different in pre and post menopausal women Yeah by and large pre menopausal women don't get osteoporosis So you know if they do then there has to be a specific reason there's a disease there But post menopausal women obviously do get osteoporosis and all our strategies that we're talking about are really targeted towards post menopausal so what would be the difference in the management of osteoporotic pain uh, based on the severity of disease yeah so we talking of two separate things when we talk of management of osteoporosis i mentioned drugs like bisphosphonates drugs like teriparatide or denosumab you know that whole group of drugs those drugs don't relieve pain of osteoporosis they prevent osteoporotic fracture what do statins do for cholesterol they reduce cholesterol and reduce the risk of heart attacks they don't treat chest pain right so to treat pain of osteoporosis you have to fall back on conventional measures you have to fall back on on painkillers opioid and non opioid painkillers some people may use good old calcitonin in acute vertebral fractures and nowadays there are many techniques that are expert surgeons or interventional radiologists employ including things like kyphoplasty and others which provide immediate relief of pain from a vertebral fracture so so in other words pain management in osteoporosis is very much a orthopedic surgeon's domain whether it is by using powerful painkillers or doing procedures that reduce the pain or actually taking the patient in for a surgical intervention that choice is left to them a curious question are women under or overrated for osteoporosis and how to make sure that dose is <coughs> optimum well uh, globally uh, most patients with osteoporosis are still undiagnosed so there are various levels of stratification women do not get diagnosed for osteoporosis because they we don't check bone densities it's not possible in a situation like india to have everyone's bone density done but nevertheless worldwide because there are no symptoms till a fracture occurs this is that's one part of the problem that preventing the first fracture 
by diagnosing osteoporosis early and initiating measures and methods to reduce the risk of fracture. But I think that's only a minor part of the pain that we undergo. The, the more significant and almost, if I could use the word, tragic situation is that people who've gotten a fracture, gone to the hospital with a vertebral or a hip fracture or a wrist fracture, which is clearly an osteoporotic fracture, still do not get adequate treatment to prevent their second fracture. So you understand what I'm saying. One is, you, you, is a is utopian situation, people get screened, we are preventing fractures all around. The second is, somebody who's had a fracture and reached the healthcare system, reached you or me or our friends, and we have fixed the fracture very well. The orthopedic surgeons have fixed the fracture perfectly. And yet, patients are not getting appropriate advice to prevent the second fracture, which is a big program called Capture the Fracture. So anybody who presents to the medical system with a fracture is likely to get a fracture again in the next six months, next one year, next few years. So if you have a patient with an osteoporotic fracture, it is, it is your duty, our duty, to make sure that we give correct advice in terms of diet, lifestyle, exercise, calcium, vitamin D and proper drugs so that we can prevent the second fracture from happening in that person. If we can all today decide that anybody who comes with a fracture due to osteoporosis will not, will not be allowed to, to get a second fracture or at least we can reduce the risk of a second fracture by not allowing the patient to go treatment free which means we must treat people who already have had osteoporotic fractures. And just by capturing all those fractures, capturing all those patients and treating them properly, we'll be able to reduce their risk of subsequent fractures very substantially. And that will be a huge service to humanity and to our patients. Can you just elaborate a little on the use of calcium and vitamin D in the management of osteoporosis? Sure. So, you know, uh, calcium and vitamin D are, are, are like the brick and cement. You know, without that, whatever fancy stuff you do with all the new drugs will all go waste. If you don't have enough calcium, which can fill up your bones or build your bones, and if you don't have enough vitamin D, which will ensure that the calcium gets absorbed and reaches your bone, you're, you're, you're fighting a losing battle. So you need to have these two in place. So, uh, yes, it is important to have adequate calcium intake, which means that uh, if you need to have adequate amount of milk products, we can have low fat milk products to avoid the metabolic risks associated with, with milk. So low fat milk, low fat milk products in adequate amounts, if required calcium supplements. And along with that, adequate amount of vitamin D and, and this is important. Now, India is a country where both these problems uh, you know, uh, are, are, are common, which is that people may not be taking enough calcium in their diets because many of us may not be able to afford even milk and milk products and others who can afford don't take it for various reasons. And the second is that numerous studies from across the country have shown that more than 80% of urban Indians may be having 25 D levels which are actually lower than what they should be. So if 80% of us don't have really good D levels and we don't take enough calcium, our bones will definitely be weak. So I think it's important that while we talk about newer drugs and how to treat people who have osteoporosis, in prevention as well as in treatment, we need to ensure, let's say, roughly rule of the thumb one gram of calcium intake a day and for Indians who have low D levels to begin with roughly 2000 units of vitamin D per day are important for us to build our bones maintain our bones and also to make sure that the drugs that we are using for osteoporosis they work efficiently and effectively. So what would you recommend for the treatment of senile osteoporosis? I think uh, senile osteoporosis uh, is more or less similar to postmenopausal osteoporosis because osteoporosis in men 
as well as osteoporosis in older women is about the same. So it really does not make a huge difference to the treatment plan. The same drugs that I mentioned. So for example, uh, let's talk a little bit about bisphosphonates, you know, which are the commonly used drugs. So bisphosphonates, there are oral bisphosphonates or of which the prototype is alendronate. And then you have intravenous bisphosphonates of which the prototype is, is uh, zolidronic acid, right? So oral is alendronate, let's say, and, 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 and ibandronate, two good examples. Risidronate is a third example. Alendronate is given once a week. Ibandronate is given once a month. And the intravenous bisphosphonate, so lidronic acid, which, have, which has become really popular in the last few years, is given once a year as an intravenous infusion. That is the spectrum of bisphosphonates. Then we have teriparatide, which is used, as I said, in all forms of osteoporosis, but particularly in vertebral osteoporosis. Teriparatide is PTH. PTH, that is given as a injectable form, sub-Q injection, like you use insulin, you know, through a pen, daily for 18 to 24 months. And the third group is denisumab, which is a monoclonal antibody against the rank ligand, which again reduces bone desorption. And that is used as a sub-Q injection once in six months. So the spectrum of agents used to treat osteoporosis in the elderly, regardless of their sex, is drugs that reduce resorption, the bisphosphonates, drugs that improve or enhance formation, like teriparatide slash PTH, and newer drugs like denisumab, which do both but are primarily anti-resorptive agents. Uh, is there any relationship between male infertility and osteoporosis? I think that's a intriguing question. Uh, we're talking of osteoporosis in men, and I did briefly mention that one of the reasons for osteoporosis in men is a low testosterone level. So it's not really a relationship between male infertility and osteoporosis. It's a relationship between hypogonadism, that is a low testosterone in men, which also contributes to osteoporosis. So if you have hypogonadal men, you will have infertility on the one hand and osteoporosis on the other hand. So therefore, in men, when we treat osteoporosis, it's important to normalize or optimize their testosterone level. So you may want to, either the osteoporosis is purely testosterone based, in which case you may use testosterone as your main drug. Otherwise, you may want to normalize testosterone and use the other agents that we just talked about. Uh, what are the risk groups in male for osteoporosis and at what age they should undergo this assessment for osteoporosis? Well, uh, that's a, the second part is a difficult question. There is no simple answer. But uh, men who are at risk for osteoporosis, clearly elderly men who have, who have uh, you know, uh, poor nutrition, uh, poor calcium intakes, those who are low in vitamin D, those who have issues with their testosterone, hypogonadism, may not be overt hypogonadism, just a low testosterone. Those who may be having underlying celiac disease, autoimmune condition, where absorption goes down. So those are groups, certainly elderly, indoor confined, all those are groups that are more prone to osteoporosis. But it's important to understand here that there's a whole group of people whose bone density may not be so low, but they may still be at risk for osteoporotic fractures because of other issues and I'll explain that. So people with low bone, low muscle mass, we talked of bone mass, bone density, people with low muscle mass or sarcopenic individuals are also at risk of osteoporotic fractures because their muscles are weak and they will tend to fall much more. Extra skeletal issues like, like you know, cataracts, neuromuscular, uh, neuromuscular incoordination, neurological conditions, Parkinson's disease, stroke. People who are in that age group have a greater risk of falling. And because of the risk of falling, they are at greater risk of osteoporotic fractures, even though their bone density per se may not be so severely affected. Nowadays, there is a huge focus on diabetes and osteoporosis. And there is this whole new information coming out 
suggesting that diabetics may actually be at greater risk for fractures and there may actually be a condition called as di diabetes related bone disease or diabetic osteodystrophy if you will which makes these people more prone to fractures and the important part is that in type 2 diabetes which is the common variety of diabetes that you see this may happen despite having a reasonable bone density you understand what I'm saying bone quality may be impacted in diabetes more than bone density and therefore diabetes uh, people with diabetes may be more prone to fractures despite having a relatively normal bone density and that's a huge area of research upcoming both men and women so so it's 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 a very very important area for all of us thank you so much dr mitchell for having this discussion and sharing your insightful thoughts on osteoporosis management in the second part of the interview we'll be discussing about thyroid disorders with dr amrish mitchell thank you these interviews are featured exclusively for the doctors of doplexis community to receive updates about such upcoming events and interviews please subscribe us on youtube like us on facebook and follow us on twitter happy doplexing